Hi, and welcome to Power Views. I'm Dan McDade, your host and president of Point Clear. My guest today is Matt Hines. In addition to being a client many moons ago when he was with Verdiem, he's also held positions at companies including Microsoft, Boeing, and the Seattle Mariners. And some of those baseballs you see behind him come from those days as well as his Little League days. In 2007, Matt began Hines Marketing. His firm helps clients identify market and customer opportunities and then helps them with plans to scale revenue and customer growth. Matt lives in Kirkland, Washington with his wife Beth, three children, and a menagerie of animals including a dog, a cat, and six chickens. Matt, welcome to Power Views. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Hey, listen, I've been looking forward to this when we go back a long time. I, um, first of all, I have to ask you, uh, what is this about the chickens? <laughs> You know, uh, my wife, every year the garden gets bigger and bigger. Um, I'm garden infrastructure guy, by the way, so I'm, I'm building planter boxes and whatnot. One year she comes and says she wants chicken. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought they were going to be noisy, smelly, and awful, and they've been none of those things. They're lower maintenance than the cat, for crying out loud. Is that right? Uh, we built a chicken coop in the backyard. We live uh, on a green bank, next to a green bank. Um, and the eggs, uh, they're the best. I mean, I, they're the best eggs you'll ever have. In fact, I really miss them in the winter when they stop laying. We have to buy, you know, eggs from the store again. Oh, gosh. Um, but um, and they're great. The kids love them. They're great pets. Oh well, good. Well, that's that's cool. My uh, one of my daughters is interested in getting chickens and, and and found this coop someplace that was like a, a state of the art coop. So they're wow. hoping to do that this spring. Um, so let's start off, you know, kind of at thirty thousand feet. You know, what's the what are the biggest problems that marketing teams are facing right now? Uh, you know, I. I think the, one of the biggest problems marketing teams have right now, they're generating themselves because they're not taking responsibility for revenue. I think a lot of marketing groups we talk to and that we see out there, you know, they still focus on leads, they focus on quality leads, but they don't take responsibility for what happens after the lead is generated. Uh, they don't want to be held responsible for the revenue created. Uh, it, I actually enjoy having this conversation when I get to talk to sales uh, managers. So I'll say, listen, most marketers, the reason they don't want that is to say, they say they don't have control over when the deal closes. Raise your hand in this room, bunch of sales execs, if you have control over when the deal closes, <laughs> because you don't. Um, you ask a bunch of buyers if they, I mean, most buyers don't control this either, right? So I think marketers sometimes are their own worst enemy because they're not aligning their priorities with the priorities of the business. And if they would simply align themselves with sales, align themselves with the organization's revenue goals, it would help them focus better. I think it helped them execute better. The alignment with sales is not just sitting in a bunch of meetings. It's really understanding that you have to triage on a regular basis what's working and what's not, find the sweet spots that are working, and then dig into that and lean into those opportunities. That, I think, is the biggest challenge for marketing today. And you know, most marketers you meet that have this challenge, they're fully capable. They're very smart people. They know what they're doing. But if they could make that mind shift, I think they'd be a lot more successful. You know, it's interesting to say or to hear you say that you feel like marketing is focused on quality because I'm finding exactly the opposite right now. You know, we work with some of the biggest software companies in the world, and, um, you know, the quality that's being pumped out of marketing is just abysmal. Um, as a matter of fact, we have one situation where 9,000 leads were generated and the qualified rate was 1.28%. Wow. And uh, their response uh, when we gave them this information was is that, well, they just won't have us qualify anymore. They'll just send them directly to sales. So, um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I love it when I hear somebody in marketing say they're interested in quality. Of course, many say they're interested in quality. But what it comes down to is, is that they basically are given a budget, and they're told to create a certain number of leads. The budget goes down every year, and the number of leads goes up every year, and they have their hands tied as far as I can see. Well, I, I met someone at a conference last week who was, you know, just working on their Q4 goals and the, their goals tied to, you know, MQLs, SQLs, um, you know, different stages of qualification. And she believed that her the goal she had of getting qualified leads into a demo was too high, right? And so she'd just been told what this goal was. And she was explaining to me how she was going to game the system, right? How she was basically going to, instead of asking people to get a live demo, she was going to push them to a demo video and call it a day. And so when you get to the point when you're gaming the system like that, you're not providing value to the organization. You know, whether whether you know it's only it's only a matter of time before you're found out and you're not really providing value. So yeah. I don't know, like you're you're right, Dan. I mean like there's a lot of companies that are still not doing quality marketing, it's probably being a little too kind, but um 
but I think a lot of that comes down to like you know where your bread's butter. You know yeah. where does your sheet sit, and how you know how how much do you really care about the results for the organization as opposed to hitting whatever your internal number is and getting home. Well, I think you gave us a hint about this just a minute or so ago, but when you talk about alignment between marketing and sales, um, how do you reach that state, and and then how do you get companies to actually stick with it? Well, I think a couple things are important. I mean, we could spend the whole hour talking about yeah. this, obviously. I mean, I think, you know, um, you know, consistent objectives is really important. Sales objective is, is marketing objective. Done. Sales is the objective, right? It doesn't mean that marketing works for sales. It means they're both responsible and they both, they're, both of those parts are required to hit that sales number. You have to have sales and marketing leaders that believe in this, that aren't just giving it lip service. I mean, I've seen companies that talk about aligning sales and marketing, but at the end of the day, the sales team doesn't trust marketing, and the marketing people still think that sales is just you know blowing smoke up or something, right? right. And also, you have to have leadership above sales and marketing believing in this and driving for this. Because if it's not established as not just a priority but a mandate, then it's just not going to get done very effectively. So you know, common ground I think is what it comes down to. But if you can translate that into what are the things you're doing on a daily basis, it's not just sitting in meetings more often together. It's having high-level overall goals that you share, but also understanding the daily, weekly metrics you're going to work towards. Understanding that a lot of things you do aren't going to work. That some sources of leads aren't going to suck, right? <laughs> some salespeople are going to suck with their follow-up. This is just the nature of the beast. And I think a lot of companies use those examples of things not working as proof that, see, we can't make this work, right? This is never going to work. Well, if you're doing it right, you will still always have those situations. But you work through it as opposed to using it as an excuse to quit. I want to ask you a couple of things. You've experienced some growth over the last couple of years, and uh, I think I, if I remember reading it correctly, I think you have something like 15,000 Twitter followers. <clears throat> to be honest with you, I was a little jealous when I saw that because I consider you sort of a young whippersnapper in this industry, and I think I don't have near that many. Um, but, you know, also you do uh, sort of eat your own dog food, so to speak, um, in terms of how you go about generating leads for your company. You know, comment on a couple of things. One, how does somebody increase their Twitter following? I'm sure that's more, more complicated than the quest, simple question. And then secondly, you know, what are you guys doing to generate leads? Um, you know, what's been successful? And, you know, what do you recommend to the audience? So good questions. Um, you know, we're just, I think the, the answer that I have to give on that is not necessarily the answer everyone wants to hear, which is we work at it every single day and have done so for eight years. I mean, I started the business five years ago. Um, three years before that, I knew I was going to want to do something on my own. So I started blogging. I started trying to understand how to build a better network. Started using LinkedIn. Um, and, and there are, I mean, again, we spent a lot more time on this. I mean, I, and, I, and I, I'm happy to share with anyone exactly what we're doing, um, knowing that most people aren't going to follow it because it mm -hmm. takes a discipline every day. Every day you're reaching out to people. Every day you're engaging. Every day you're participating in a community. Um, we publish a blog post now every single day. We used to do it every weekday. Now we do it every day. We've got over 1,600 blog posts on our website that drive traffic from Google and other sources. We've got offers of white papers and digital copies of books we've written on the sidebar. And through those things, and by then curating other people's great content, including yours and others, in our, you know, that are the thought leaders we learn from in the industry, you know, we're that's what's giving us more traffic. It's what's getting us more social followers. Uh, you know, we're generating. I mean, we're literally generating 10 to 15 leads a day off of our website for people registering for, for, for various white papers and books. Um, and our traffic isn't that high. We're just, you know, we're just a small little business here. But, you know, what I'm proud of is the fact that, you know, we've been able to do a lot of this without really spending money on marketing. We're not doing a lot of paid advertising, um, but we're using the content to drive inbound leads. Now, the, the challenge with that is that, Someone that wants a white paper is not necessarily ready to buy, right? right? The vast majority of those leads I speak of, which is fantastic, are people that now uh, are exposed to our content and, you know, maybe subscribe to our newsletter and maybe now following some of the things we have to say. Um, it's up to us now to figure out which of those leads actually have something that immediately we can solve. But we know that the vast majority, the vast majority, though qualified, may are likely not ready to buy. And so, you know, most organizations, even if you're, you know, Fortune 500 company, know that the leads you're generating need to be qualified and in some cases shouldn't go to sales to begin with, right? If someone is exploring, if they're looking into something, then let them follow their path. Look for the buying signals and trigger events that can allow you to engage. Um, but don't expect that, you know, the majority of those leads are going to close anytime soon.
Yeah. What, what would you say, and I, I'm, this is kind of just off the cuff, but I would say, you know, I go through my visitor reports every day, and I would say probably, you know, if I get 15, 20, 25, whatever the number is, you know, that I'm lucky if there's one or two or three of those that are in big enough companies that mm-hmm. really make sense for us to sell to. Um, you know, the other ones, we I always offer to help anybody. I don't care what size company you are. If I can help you, I'm happy to help you. But, but you know, do, would you say that would be typical for you that, you know, maybe 5 to 10% of the visitors actually are companies that are really worth your taking time to work on? Or what would you say your numbers are? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say it's definitely the minority, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the majority of people we find are people that – aren't necessarily companies we're targeting. Now, we've done business with some of those companies that are small, but, you know, they're willing to invest and want to invest in growth. Um, But the minority definitely are sort of smaller companies. Now, we've actually taken steps to try to improve that. Um, We're never going to get to 100%, nor do I know that I have that as a goal. But we're starting to cover topics that we think appeal to larger organizations. So, for instance, we're spending more time thinking about and writing about database database hygiene, right, and really investing in the processes and tools to keep your database clean. SMB companies just aren't thinking about that as much. It tends to be more of a mid-market thing. You know, we're spending more time talking about advanced lead scoring and how to actually sort of score more different activities on your site, in your community, as well as outside of your community to drive uh, better lead scoring and triage and what goes to sales and what doesn't. So we're trying to actually sort of use our content strategy to attract more of the companies we care about. It'll never be perfect, but we are starting to see a shift. I'm definitely starting to see a higher percent of the, uh, not necessarily the good companies, right, but like companies that are clearly larger on our site, and then more importantly, a larger percent of the companies and the individuals that download our content and and get into our database are larger organizations as well. So um, you can definitely move the needle just with the nature of what you're publishing. Now I heard you. I heard you speak at Sales 2.0 last April. As I told you that, I thought you did a fantastic job. I was going to ask you if there were, if you know, somebody only had time, to, time and energy to um, work with maybe three or four or five tools. You know, what tools would you recommend? What would you prioritize as sort of the highest and best use of people's time regarding all of the tools that are out there right now? Yeah. Um, you know, the I would say in terms of the, I think social. You know, the uh, you know for B two B. LinkedIn for sales and marketing professionals is the most important tool that you have. I mean, if, and and you know, before you even think about the paid version, take advantage of the free features. Take advantage of the fact that you know your Outlook contacts is really not that much better than your the old roll paper Rolodex, right? Yeah, like you have yeah. to have that in a format where you can see the relationships. Um, you know, LinkedIn has a very powerful contact tool now that will aggregate all of your contacts from various networks together. Every morning you can get an email that says when someone changed jobs, when they got a title change, when they were in the news, work anniversaries, birthdays. These are all trigger events you can follow up with as a sales or marketing person, especially if you're in sales or business development. I can't tell you how many times I've reached out to someone to say happy birthday and it turns into a business conversation Is that right? because it was an impression <laughs> in front of people. Yeah. Um, there's an ecosystem of tools around LinkedIn that can help as well. There's a tool called Newsly, N-E-W-S-L-E, yeah. that will tell you anyone who's a first connection when they were mentioned in the news. There's a great tool called O Funnel, just the letter O and then Funnel. Uh, you can tell it. I want to get in. I want to know when anyone in my network connects with someone who's a CMO or an or 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 a CRO. It'll give you an email every day giving those alerts where you can ask them people in your network for introductions. So LinkedIn, I think, for sure is the most important. The other one might surprise you, and it's actually just a pretty basic, just calendar request for yourself every day. I think you know most people have a number of these tools and alerts and emails set up that are giving them these buying signals, but no one has time to do that throughout the day, right? Like those pile up and we don't. So what I'd recommend people do is set aside time on a daily basis that becomes your daily do. Like every morning at 7.30, I have my daily do list, and it's a series of things. Everything from, you know, you know, sort of process yesterday's leads, check in on the happy birthdays from LinkedIn, um, send thank you notes or thank you emails from yesterday's meetings I may have had. It's a series of things that I need to be doing on a daily basis. But as I mentioned before, there isn't necessarily some magic pill or secret sauce to getting our what now is actually eighteen thousand plus uh, oh. Twitter followers. <laughs> um, but it's just it's just execution on a daily basis. It's consistently putting your hard hat on every day and doing the work. And so I know that's not sort of an app necessarily, but I'm finding that that system now, that, that process of doing that every day is, 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 is key uh, to getting stuff done for me. How many, how many tweets do you send out a day, would you guess? 
I think I'm averaging probably in the six to eight range. It right, might be okay. higher than that. I mean, some of it's automated, so I, I use a tool called Buffer to automatically post three links a day that are sales, marketing, or productivity related that I find earlier and then just queue up. Yep. Um, every morning, I've got a tool called Deliver It uh, that automatically posts uh, the, the day, our day's blog post up for that. And then, you know, I'll reply to things, and I try to retweet other people's things throughout the day. Um, I think one thing people forget about Twitter is it's not email, right? I mean, like, you know, email someone's going to get. A tweet is like, you know, driving by someone's house and throwing something at the at the mailbox, right? Yeah, right. Most people aren't going to see it. Yeah. So frequency actually helps you increase the small percent of those tweets someone actually sees. Mm-hmm. And if, you know, you know, the Don Draper's world may not be as relevant today, but one thing he said, the one thing that he would believe is clearly important today, impressions still matter, right? Mm-hmm. So everything from someone sees a tweet from you, even if it was someone else's content, they see that you liked something on their LinkedIn page, they just say happy birthday, those impressions all build up. And if you're in a relationship building business, if you're in a business where relationships matter, then those relate, those impressions will accelerate the path towards trust, credibility, preference, so that when someone actually needs someone, they're calling you first. Yeah. Hey, one last question, and I'm going to move on. But um, when you get up at 7 or get to the desk at 7.30 and you start working through your list about how many hours a day do you think you put against kind of social-related activities, do you have a sense for that on average? Does that include blog writing? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Not including blog writing, I'd say 30 to 45 minutes a day. Okay. Well, I, I really don't spend that much time on it. And I... And I, you know, I think I could easily justify two to three x that plus because I mean you can go down the down the rabbit hole and and, find, and justify a lot of good value, but I tend to find if I know what I need to do, if I get in, do it efficiently, and get out, if I have the right processes and the right tools, I can be active, I can get the value, but then I can get back to work and do the other things I need to do during the day. So people are surprised when I tell them that's that amount of time because when if you look at you know, what I'm doing on various social channels, it looks more active than that. But that's because of the processes and the tools that we're using. Yeah, speaking of blogs, you mentioned blogs just a minute or so ago. There was one in early October. Um, you were in the hot seat, and uh, I don't know if you remember that one. But yeah. the, the one that I kind of picked up on was that describe um, your three best practices for social marketing lead generation, and they were, you know, focus on the problem, not the solution, track activity in a CRM, and then get sales involved. I wonder if you want to just add anything to that. I thought that was good advice. As a matter of fact, I sent it to several people in our company today. <laughs> you know, so thank you for that. I um, I think you know, one, of the, one of the worst terms in marketing is the term product marketing, right? Because I think a lot of people think about product marketing and then they produce content that's about the product, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the product doesn't matter, right? The product's a means to an end. So I think if you're doing marketing right, your marketing isn't about products. It's about people and problems. And if, it, if, you, if we were to force ourselves to do our marketing based on the, the customer only, we'd all be better off. I think, like, for instance, like I've, I've actually seen inside sales teams be successful by totally changing their script so that in their lead qualification calls, they're not allowed to talk about the product at all. You cannot talk about it. You cannot describe it. You can merely qualify on need and value, right? You can have a conversation that's about the customer that, talk, that, that qualifies whether they have a need you can solve. And at the end of that conversation, say, you know, everything we just talked about, that's what we do. We do that for hundreds of companies across the country. Would you like to learn more about that? Would you like to see how we do that, right? Now you have someone that isn't, they're not necessarily more interested in the product, but they're interested in the problem you solve. And that's way more important. And I think, you know, we're all excited about what we do. Hopefully, if you're doing something, you're proud of it and you're proud of the product. But you can't lead with that, right? I think Jeff Thal, who wrote Mastering the Complex Sale, says that if you're doing it right, if you're doing the diagnostic sales process right, when you get to the demo, it's part of the close, not part of the sale. Like mm-hmm. It's not part of the pitch. The pitch is about value and outcome and need. How you deliver that is at the end of the process, not the beginning. Yeah, I have a I have a sales process that, you know, there's many sales processes out there. A lot of them are really good. But I, my simple sales process is you find the pay or need, you get agreement that there's pain or need. You get agreement to do something about the pain or need. You agree to a generic solution, and then you agree to a customized specific solution. So I'm with you that step five is when you really get into, you know, well, you know, based on everything I've heard, here's how I think we can add value in this equation. Uh, a lot of people like sale, marketing starts and stops at step one, and sales starts and stops at step five. So it's no wonder we have an alignment problem, you know. Exactly, um, exactly. Um, 
What, how about, you know, you mentioned a book just a minute ago. What are you reading now, and, you know, what are what are your top suggestions for the audience that uh, you think they should be reading if they want to continue to innovate in this marketing and sales space? Well, it's funny. When you, when you ask that question, the first book I think about is what I'm reading um, with my wife, a book called um, Siblings Without Rivalry. Our kids are getting <laughs> older, and that's becoming a critical issue to try to drive the kind of, you know, lack of stress that I have. Um, yeah. You know, I... I um, I think if you haven't read The Challenger Sale, it's an important book to read. Uh, it's not necessarily groundbreaking new ideas, but it's presented in a really compelling way. Um, I, I think it's a textbook for marketers as much as it is for salespeople. Um, yeah, so I think that's really important. I think um, I think Daniel Pink's new book, um, you know, To Sell as Human, is another flavor of that. I think the more you can, you can, the more you can think about yourself as a seller, as someone who's providing value, not just selling a service and solution, I think the better off you are. Um, you know, the other things I'm reading, I, I, I try to read books, but I also, uh, you know, I'm a religious reader of various blogs and newsletters. Uh, if you're in sales, uh, I think the Smart Brief on sales and the Smart Brief folks is mandatory reading. They're, it's one of those those newsletters that every day, I don't know how many blogs they read, but they will publish the best six to eight posts, you know, hmm. from the blogosphere from the day before in their newsletter. Hmm. And I don't read everything, but I can scan it and find a lot of really good things. Um, I read the Point Clear blog. I read uh, Anthony Ian Arino's blog. Yeah. Um, Jill Conrath. Um, I think um, you know Coca Sexton, um, Jamie Shanks are a couple of really smart people from a social selling standpoint. Um, so I, you know, I just, uh, I, you know, I try to consume as much of that stuff as I can, just because that's that's where I learn. And I think, you know, um, you know, books are great, but I think you know, blogs tend to be sort of that real time conversational channel where you can just get things um, that are happening right now. Okay, great. Well, Matt, how can the audience get a hold of you if they want to follow up on uh, watching you today? Sure. Um, I mean, I think you can go to just HeinzMarketing.com. It's Heinz like the ketchup, uh, H-E-I-N-Z marketing.com. Um, I'm just Matt, M-A-T-T, at HeinzMarketing.com. Uh, Twitter is just at Heinz Market, so pretty easy to remember. And uh, would love if anyone has any questions or wants to say hello, please feel free to reach out. All right, well, great. Well, I'll continue to follow you. I'll continue to read all about you and uh, hope for every success. I really appreciate you joining me today. And for now, this is Dan McDade signing off on another edition of Power Views. Thank you for watching.